I sat on the couch and wept because I know people who I think are missing in their lives. Mm. And I think that's the worst thing you can do. It's not about whether you have a happy life or a good life or a safe life or any of that. It's about you have your life and you live it yeah. as you and you make decisions based on what you feel and think, what your judgment tells you, rather than always letting other people make those decisions for you because they're right or wiser. Then you'll miss it and it's the only life we've got. How can you face anxiety and still find a way to move forward in this world? As women, how do we find our voice and feel confident enough to shout it from the rooftops? Plus, how can storytelling help us to connect better? Hi, I'm Nicole Sharonam, and today on Connectedly, we are talking with Jane Caro, Walkley award-winning columnist, author, novelist, broadcaster, documentary maker, feminist, and social commentator. An absolute mouthful. Jane is an absolute gift. We talk about dismantling harmful hierarchies, understanding the importance of listening, and the realisation that we are all fundamentally more similar than we are different. Addressing the challenges that women face, we discuss the pressure to conform and the anxiety for constant perfection. And Jane opens up about her struggles with anxiety, her perspective on happiness not being a goal, but rather a consequence of contentment, and the critical role of storytelling in fostering connection and happiness. Jane appears frequently on The Drum, Today Extra, and she has created and presented five documentary series for ABC Compass, and she is in demand as a speaker, panel, facilitator, and MC. And remember, if you want to get involved in this conversation, then ask a question. Tell me who you want to hear from, and I'll interview them. Just go to the show notes, go to the website, and use the contact form and send me a question. So let's jump right in. Hi, Jane. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Nicole. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you so much for joining us here today. You are a highly accomplished, strong, fierce, outspoken woman, and what a pleasure to have someone like you to join with me today. I'm I'm so overwhelmed, and I have a confession. I actually, when you said yes to come on board this podcast, I had this panic attack moment where I was like, oh my gosh, what? I'm like, what am I going to say to this woman? This woman's been asked everything under the sun. What could I ask that would be new? Then I realized I'm, I'm doing what every woman or person probably does and, and had to step out of myself for a moment and go, I am not here to, to talk about politics. You know, I'm here to talk to you and see you as a person and actually talk about some of the things that make you real and and that resonate with a whole broad audience of women who who find it really hard to find their voice. And I thought yeah. that is what I'm here for today. So thank you for putting me through that little challenge. <laughs> I'm glad I did that, uh, though I had no idea I was doing that. So <laughs> oh, no. that's not funny. The things we do, right, in our heads. <laughs> yeah. I would love for you, if you can, please, to ask, to tell us a little bit about not what you do, but what makes you tick? Who are you? Big question. Well, you know, I'm just a very ordinary person. Uh, but then everyone is an ordinary person. The people you put on pedestals and admire uh, never, ever are what you think they are. Um, and all of us um, have our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities and our doubts and our fears and our failings and all those kinds of things. Of course we do. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm just a person who's, well, I'm, you know, I've lived a long life now. I'm 66 and, uh, it's interesting getting older. That's a, that's a whole new adventure. Um, but I think I've tried, I've tried, not always succeeded by any means, but I've tried to stay open to the world. And I've tried to remain curious and interested in what's going on. Um, when I was young, I suffered from a very um, florid anxiety neurosis. Um, and I worked very hard uh, to try and, well, I wanted to cure it. But of course, um, it's not 
cure is not the right thing, I found out. Actually, what I needed to do was turn around and embrace it and stop trying to run away from it. Mm. And once I did that, um, I found that over time, my anxiety neurosis completely disappeared. But the journey I went on to, in fact, some people may claim I've overcorrected. I have used that line a few times, but I think they may be separate. <laughs> but I'm so not anxious now. Like I'm so not anxious. And that used to be really a defining characteristic. And I used to think anxiety was like having a sixth finger. It was just a kind of um, life sentence or a deformity that you had to live with. It's not true. And I know a lot of women suffer from anxiety and I know a lot of young women suffer from anxiety. And I'm here to say to you, it is not a life sentence. It can be overcome, I suppose, or just, I think it's more like you incorporate. Mm. You incorporate fear, not anxiety. So what you do is you stop fearing fear and you say, sometimes I will be afraid and that's okay. Mm. Um, And so in a way... What we do with anxiety all the time is we're trying to control. Like I think anxiety is all about trying to control things you can't control. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned painstakingly and painfully was what I could control and what I couldn't control. And I started to only worry about the things I could control and let the things I couldn't control go. And that's when my anxiety went away. Wow. So I've been someone who has uh, searched I, I like to nut out. Why is it like that? Why am mm. I feeling like that? Why do I have that reaction? Why is that person responding to me that way? What, what's behind that? And um, I've gone through my life doing that, unpicking and trying to make sense of. So I'm a, a person who asks questions, I suppose, of yeah. myself as much as of anyone else. Um, and I'm also, a, I, I, I have a real sense of fairness and equity and justice. I know I'm a very privileged person. I was born into, you know, loving, comfortably off, um, family of very intelligent, highly educated parents. Um, we weren't perfect by any means. There are uh, always issues in every family. Thank goodness, perfect families would be the worst imaginable thing. A perfect parent must only produce completely neurotic children. So again, it's another way of forgiving ourselves for our failings and our weaknesses and embracing those mm-hmm. and saying, actually, I'm fine just the way I am, including my bad bits. Mm. I'm fine, you know. That's the hard part that I think women find is still seeking perfection. What a crock of shit that search is. Crock mm. of shit. If you ever did find it, it would be the end of you. So mm. um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's working out what you are seeking and what it is you want to find. And I think in the end, what I've decided I want to find, and sometimes I think I've found it and then, of course, it slips away, but I think what I've wanted to find is an E in my own skin. Mm. That's it. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> sometimes I, I have it. I have it sometimes. And I think it's, I think it's got a lot to do with humour. Because I think humour is a recognition of our humanity, our foibles, our weaknesses, our failings, and and a comfort with them, a co- being mm. comfortable with them, with your weight, with your age, with your saggy, baggy net. Um, not loving it. I can't say I love it, mm. but I'm comfortable with it. It doesn't mm. worry me. I don't obsess over it. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. It's that. That somehow self acceptance, I think, is what I've looked for. And I've found bits. Of- yeah, well, you, you've really, there's a lot in that one answer. There's really a lot because you've, you've talked a little about this anxiety and, and almost allowing, not trying to shut it all off and, and not try to fix it which then kind of merges into you, we don't have to be perfect kind of segue. Um, and I think I love what you said about really just trying to understand yourself because I'm very much the same. I call myself an explorer of myself. You know, I'm constantly trying to understand why did I do that or how come that is that way. 
And I guess I'd love to talk a little bit more about that anxiety piece because I'm I'm with you. I think it is a huge, um, you know, something that is constantly coming up for women and men, but, you know, we're here to talk about women. So I'd love to know a little bit more about how, I mean, it's to say it in words just to go, uh, okay, I'm going to just accept. It, it's easy to say it, but how? Was there anything practical in there that you could say that would help women that are going through that? Well, I can just tell you my journey. Mm. And um, I wrote about this in my memoir, um, Plain Speaking Jane. Um, I was hit by anxiety like a kind of bolt from the blue as I got ready to leave university. And it was um, a form of OCD, but I didn't have the compulsions. I just had the obsessive intrusive thoughts and, um, you know, it was awful and I was very unhappy and very frightened and very anxious and, you know, really in a bad way. I think I had a kind of walking nervous breakdown really, um, because I continued to fun- function just kind of crippled mm-hmm. internally. I couldn't take any joy in, in much. Um, and I sought help. I went to see psychiatrists and psychologists and all sorts of people. And from each of those professionals, I learned really interesting things, particularly in the end from a, um, a counsellor who really, a well, feminist counsellor too, incredibly important that I think, um, who helped me reframe the world in many ways. I mean, she would say things like I'd go into her sessions and I'd, you know, be crying, of course. And um, I'd say to her, you know, um, say I've been humiliated by someone at work. But, you know, I remember saying to her once, you know, he said in front of everyone that I was just too emotional and um, too dramatic and um, all of that sort of thing. And she said, well, do you agree with him? Do you think you are? And I started to cry and said, well, a lot of people have said that to me and, you know, so it must be true. And she said to me, people, Jane, or men? And I went, oh. Mm. And she said, and let me ask you another question. How much, how much is enough of a reaction? How much is too much reaction and how much is too little? How much is enough emotion? How much is too much emotion and how much is too little? And who gets to decide? And I said, mm. so you're saying that I handed my power away to him and gave, made him the arbiter of what I was allowed to feel and what I was allowed to express. Yes, she said, women do that all the time. Mm. We're constantly letting other people tell us, and she said, by people, I mean men mostly, what we're allowed to feel and how much of it we're allowed to express. And she said, and who made them boss of the wash? And I thought, whoa, and gee, that stood me in good stead. She used to say to me things like, whose problem is it? Is it your problem or is it their problem? If it's their problem, forget it. Also, she said to me, I said, you know, I I think I'm very selfish and, you know, so-and-so said I was being selfish. And she said, oh, and when someone says to you, don't be selfish, what do they really say? And I went, they're saying, don't you be selfish. Let me be selfish. She said, yes. (laughs) Yes. So she, she was so good at, You know, just clarifying Mm. all those things. But even so, my anxiety remained. I learned a great deal and I got a lot of skills and strategies about, you know, not accepting other people's emotional baggage, which they wanted to dump on me. She was really good at helping me to draw those really important boundaries. You know, what you think of me is not my business. It's your business. And you're entitled to think anything you like. You're going to hate me. I don't care. It's your business. Nothing to do with me. I can just go on being myself and saying what I think and being annoying to some people and admirable to others and neither of those to most people. And who cares? That's up to me. I don't have to live up to your standards or your rules or your expectations. People often say to me on Twitter, oh, I'm disappointed. I normally like you, but I'm disappointed about such and such. Again, mostly men. And usually I go back to them and say, well, as you're not my dad and I never appointed you, I'm not sure what right you have to be disappointed. 
you don't have that kind of relationship with me where mm. I have to live up to your expectations of who I should be. Fuck off, mm. basically. Fuck off is a mm. very powerful, not just pair of words, but boundary attitude mm. about, no, you do not get to impose your crap on me. But what did start my journey towards no longer being anxious was real danger. As I say, I'm a very privileged person and I think quite protected and, you know, um, cushioned. And I think at some level my anxiety was really a healthy part of me and it was saying to me, you're not being authentic. It's also saying to me, you haven't been tested and you don't know what you're made of. And I think currently the way we bring up our children, we are doing that a lot. We're creating a generation so very, and this is class-based, obviously lots of kids are in disadvantaged families and this does not apply to them. But for those of us who are privileged like I, I am, we're bringing up our children to think they're very special, but also mm. fragile. You need to protect. And I think that's a real problem. I used to say to my girls, you're not special. I think you're special because you're my daughters, but in reality, you're just one of many. Mm -hmm. You're one of billions and you're no more or less special, no more or less important than any of those billions. So don't get ideas above your station. You're just a flick of dust like the rest of it. Um, because I felt it was really important that this idea that everybody's special, I don't like that. I don't, I think the opposite. I actually think, no, we're not special. And what a wonderful, oh, what a relief that is not to be special. Oh, my goodness, to be ordinary, fantastic. Mm. But what happened was when I had my first daughter, uh, she was born prematurely and um, she was in good, like, nick for a, um early baby. She was born at 34, 35 weeks, somewhere around there. Mm. <clears throat> and unfortunately she, I didn't go into a humidity crypt she went to a special care nursery and while she was there, she picked up an infection been in the news recently, RSV, positive bronchiolitis, for which there is no vaccination and which is still, I believe, the biggest killer of babies under one and it's certainly of premature babies. So she became particularly ill. In fact, she ended up in Camperdown Children's Hospital and uh, one particular night she stopped breathing in my arms three times and had to be resuscitated and was rus rushed into intensive care at Camperdown Children's Hospital, as it was then, um, and got the last uh, neonatal intensive care bed in New South Wales as officially the sickest baby mm. in the state. And um, that was an extremely traumatic experience. And Fortunately, because of my anxiety, neurosis and all the help I sought and received, because that's the other thing, never be afraid to ask for help. And when you do ask for help, you'll almost always find it. Um, I knew to ask for help. So I, through a connection, I managed to get onto this fabulous neonatologist at the hospital, whose name is Dr. Peter Barr. And um, he had lost, he was a neonatologist, but he'd also lost a child. So he was mm. a grief counsellor as well. And he came to see me and he said three sentences to me. And these three sentences were the three things that unlock. I didn't know that they would be at the time when he said them to me, but looking back on it, they unlocked the anxiety neurosis and began the process of it falling away. And they were, there's nothing special, hence the special word, there's nothing special about you and there's nothing special about Polly that was my baby. Terrible things can happen and they can happen to anyone. Danger is reality. Safety mm. is an illusion. And now that sounds like a brutal thing to say to Oof. any mother. I was 30, not even, I think I was 31, maybe not quite. And it was like, um, but it wasn't, it was like bricks were falling off my shoulders as he said them, because what he said to me was, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything to make this happen because I've been doing that crazy bargaining thing you do and all that superstitious. Like I'm, I am totally opposed to all the magic thinking that mm -hmm. goes on the, you know, 
positive thoughts. Or, no, fuck bullshit, no. <laughs> but no, you can be sitting on a plane and the engines fail and you can think all the positive thoughts you mm. like, mm-hmm. like hopes and prayers that the Americans like to send every time there's a shooting massacre. No, mm. no. Mm. Stop indulging yourself. Mm. Your thoughts are not that powerful and your prayers aren't either. Sorry. Mm. Mm. No, danger is reality and we're all as vulnerable to danger as anyone else and Mm. we can be the best people in the world. We can be the nicest, most self-sacrificing one. We can be praying till we're blue in the face. Terrible things can still happen to us. And the funny thing is once you accept the truth of that, you stop trying to control everything. Mm. So if you think about positive thoughts and if you think about prayers and if you, they're an attempt to control the uncontrollable, mm. that creates anxiety. It also creates a sense that if you pray and pray and you have those positive thoughts, say when people say to someone who has cancer, it's the cruelest thing you can say to them, you didn't think positively. Oh. What? Mm. Who are you? Even mm. that's just a terrible thing. Horrible. No, that's an attempt to make you feel safe. You know, it's the same. Mm. It's the same when people say when someone's been raped or whatever, and they say, "Well, what was she wearing? How many drinks did she have? Well, I would never go to that place at that time of night." That's a way of us trying to say to ourselves, "Oh, that won't happen to us because we're smarter, cleverer, more modestly dressed." Uh, believe in the right religion, um, live in the right suburb. That's that's us taking our anxiety about the truth of our own vulnerability. We're all mm. sitting on a rock that's settling through space. Um, and therefore being inadvertently perhaps cruel to someone who's actually facing danger because we don't want to accept that we're vulnerable too. And I think when he said to me, there's nothing special about you and your daughter, he made me really viscerally understand my own real human vulnerability. And once I understood and accepted that, the paradox is it makes you less anxious and more stronger in a real way or confident in a real way, which is understanding something that's true. Mm. Yeah, I almost see here an, a sense of um, surrender almost that, you know, you're not in charge of absolutely everything on this planet and, you know, that's never going to be the case. So just let go a little bit and surrender. Mm. Surrender and letting go is really important and you can't, you, you know, you, you can't, people could say let go and you say I'm trying to let go. I remember the counsellor again demonstrating how trying to let go is a waste of time. She said, I'm trying to drop the pen. I'm trying to drop the pen. I'm trying to drop the pen. I'm dropping the pen. So trying is a reason not to. Do it or don't do it. Mm. Trying, forget it. You're not, you're, you're pretending to do it, but you haven't got to the point yet where you can do it. And that's okay. Mm. you're probably not ready to get to that point yet. Fine. Accept that in yourself. Mm. Um, but it is, it, is about, it is about surrender, but it's also about knowing what you can have some impact on and what you can't. So it doesn't mean giving up on everything, mm. but it does mean giving up on wasting energy on the things you can't. Like mm. I no longer fear fly, fly at all. Because I think the pilot's flying the plane. It's his business. Or her business. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be a passenger and drink the champagne, relax and enjoy until something awful happens. And then I'll (laughs) deal with it when it happens. (laughs) Thank you for making me laugh. (laughs) Well, the end, and see, most of anxiety is anticipation. Most Mm. of anxiety is what do you think? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if that? Worry about it when it happens. Oh, my gosh, yes. I, I can hear my mum right now worrying about the Christmas lunch already. <laughs> it's like, think about it when we get there. <laughs> what will be will be. Que sera, sera. You know, that mm. song, sometimes when I find myself spiralling for some reason, 
we've just sold our house of 34 years. So, you know, there's been a lot of anxiety around that. I can tell you, I realized I hadn't lost the capacity to be anxious. Um, <laughs> I kept singing that song to myself, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You'll sell it when you sell it. You'll get what price you get. Stop it. Stop. Stop. That's stop. funny. That's actually the song I sing to my daughter who's five uh, most nights to bed. That's her lullaby. <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful because it basically says mm. deal with what is, not what might be. Mm. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Mm. And it's funny, I, I wrote a note here when you mentioned about the too dramatic um, I hear that all the time in my life. And yes, it's mostly men. Now that you say that, I'm like, oh, actually, I don't think I've ever heard that from a woman. <laughs> no, it's one of the ways they try to constrain us and restrain us. They don't necessarily know they're doing it consciously and they can get very insulted when you point it out to them. But the funny thing is, as soon as you no longer accept their attempt to put their anxiety about your bad feelings back onto you, they stop doing it. You don't even have to have the conversation. It's as if you just, when they say, to you, oh, you're so emotional, you're overreacting, and you say, sorry, who made you the grand poo bar of how much emotion you're allowed to show and how much reaction you're going to have? So as you've said that to them, they'll never say that to you again because you have just bested them. They had no mm. answer. Me? I'm the one? Her baby. Do you have an official plaque that says grand poobah of amount of emotion that is allowed to be expressed? <laughs> oh, you're, you're fantastic. Uh, I'm I, not I really. Also, I'm just down over. You are. You are. You are. You are fantastic because, as you said, the humour is something that is so vital in breaking down some of these you know, the, the nervousness, the anxieties, the stuff that's, you know, blah, just that humour just softens everything and allows us to be authentic and be vulnerable and I think that's beautiful. It's lovely. That's why Thank we you. laugh. We laugh because somebody said something we know is true but doesn't get said very often. Mm -hmm. And so we laugh with the recognition and the shock and we enjoy that and that's the thing. We're all afraid of saying what's true and real often and what's straight up. But actually when we do, it bonds us because we go, yes, that's how I feel. Relief. Somebody said the thing. Mm. That's what comedians do. Comedians are our society's truth tellers and they uh, say the shocking thing and the thing we recognize. And sometimes they say the transgressive thing. Often the thing that we don't necessarily see as admirable, but we have all have thoughts that are not admirable and mm. that's fine too. It's the same as being prejudiced. We all have prejudices. None of us are free of them. But a, what a civilised, what a person who's trying to be a good person, a decent person does, is not give in to those prejudices or try to rationalise them. They may have a thought about Asian drivers, but you'll stop yourself and think that's racist. I'm making a generalization about a group of people. That's, that's on me. That's my bad thinking. That's not on that person. Mm -hmm. and, and the same with men who say women are over emotional overreaction. No, that's you deciding they are. And that's actually to do with you and your prejudices and your insecurities about life. And you need to own that. It's okay to have it. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I have those terrible transgressive thoughts too. You're not a bad person for having them, but it's not helpful to the world and to yourself if you don't catch yourself and correct yourself and know mm. that, yes, that came out of your gut and your head is useful because it can say to you, yeah, yeah, but that doesn't make sense and it's not very nice. Mm. And I think once again you've just, <clears throat> excuse me, you've highlighted this piece about getting to know yourself better and having that self-acceptance of understanding who you are. I think that takes a lot of work, right? And I think it's a full-time job, really. It takes our whole life to fully, really understand who we are. And we keep chipping away at that. <laughs> but I think- Oh, and there's I've... always bits that you won't know and will surprise you, but that's good too. That's, that's fun. Um, mm. 
finding those bits and suddenly being blindsided by a reaction that you didn't even think you could have. That's an adventure if you're open to it. But trying to live up to other people's idea of who you should be. There was a a wonderful series that I watched. Um, It was called In Treatment and it starred... um, Oh, Gabriel Byrne is the psychiatrist, Paul. It's available, you know, you can find it somewhere, and I recommend it. And each episode was a half hour of a psychiatrist. Um, he was a psychiatrist and they're his, his patient. And each season is a different group of uh, patients, and you really watch the journey through someone's uh, psyche and coming to self-awareness. And there was one character who was an elderly man who came for help with insomnia. And very slowly over time, very successful businessman, very slowly over time, you got to understand this man was living, his older brother had died at about the age of 15 or 16. And the older brother had been the admired son in the family. And they came to understand that he was living his brother's life instead Mm -hmm. of his own. And at the end of that season, in, in his last episode, he says to the psychiatrist, oh my God, I've missed it. And Paul said, missed what? He said, my life. I've missed my life. Mm. And Paul said, would you not dead yet? And we can do the work. What do you want to do? I can cure the insomnia or we can do the work. And he chose to do the work. And I wept. I sat on the couch and wept because I think I know people who I think are missing in their lives. Mm. And I think that's the worst thing you can do. It's not about whether you have a happy life or a good life or a safe life or any of that. It's about you have your life and you live it as you and you make decisions based on what you feel and think, what your judgment tells you, rather than always letting other people make those decisions for you because they're right or wiser. Then you'll miss it and it's the only life we've got. And that to me must take a lot of, as you're learning to know yourself, it must take a lot of, I guess I want to say loving yourself because whilst we don't love every aspect of ourselves, I mean, let's be honest, there has to be a certain amount of of, of going, I, I'm okay with that in me because if there's not, you're not going to ever find that you have a voice or that you that you can speak up what your voice is authentically yes I think that's true I don't I'm never sure what we mean by the word love but I think it because I would say it means accepting yourself yeah I would say that it means accepting your base humanity um and therefore the great thing about that is what I've noticed is when I slowly and I still don't fully accept myself at all but as I've slowly gotten better at that um I found it much easier to accept other people as well so and and I've also found that if I'm prepared to tell the truth about my failings and my weaknesses and my vulnerabilities and my hopelessness other people will tell me theirs and so actually what I end up feeling is more connected and I think that's something that women know and men don't. When I watch men interact together, with many honourable exceptions, of course, I do still notice a tendency for it to be a series of stories about their triumphs or, you know, their team's triumph or it's something, Mm. there's something competitive in the interaction. And one thing I think women have learned through long millennia of being this subordinate culture is that to share fears vulnerabilities weaknesses and failings is actually where intimacy lives Mm -hmm. that's where honest interaction lives and the funny thing is when you have a friendship to where you can share your fears and, and and terrors and your failings and your humiliations you'll also develop a friendship where you can tell your occasional triumphant moments mm. that one time you said exactly the right thing at exactly the right time <laughs> uh, which you will then remember for the rest of your life and repeat as often as you possibly can <laughs> if you may um but it, it it that's where intimacy lives it lives not in our trials but in our 
in our failures and our weaknesses and our and our, the, the way we amuse ourselves with our stupidity sometimes. Mm. I mean, and mm. then, you know, it's hard to humiliate me now. You can still do it occasionally, but it's hard. It's much harder than it was when I was young where I think I was more or less constantly humiliated um, because I just think, oh, fuck it, who cares? Okay, I was wrong. Shoot me. Mm. You know. <laughs> so do you think then for, like I think of my daughter who's five and, and I appreciate absolutely what you said about, you know, not making her feel like she's the queen of the universe, um, <laughs> which she seems to think that she is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she certainly dresses like she is. But uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. But I wonder what tips you would have then in your experience in finding your voice beyond just that special piece. Is there something else that comes to mind about how to really stand behind your voice and and to use it? Well, just to, I think again it goes back to forgetting about outcomes. Outcomes can't control outcomes. All we can control is inputs. So, for example, if I go to make a, a, a keynote speech or something, um, yeah, I'm not completely indifferent to will the audience like me or not. Of course I'm not. I'm a natural born show off. Um, I quite like being in front of a camera or a microphone or whatever. I don't know why. I feed off an audience. I, I get a kind of creative flow happening somehow so all of that is part of who I am and I was supposed to be ashamed of that but I'm not anymore um mm -hmm. it's the skill like any other it's an asset and a, and, a, and a liability depending on the situation just like any other attribute but I think it comes from saying oh, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make the speech that I want to make that feels appropriate to me that uh, will interest me where I'm doing some exploring and some understanding of things as well or consolidating knowledge that I already ha have, whatever that is. Um, and how the audience responds to that is up to them. Mm. And so if you're really thinking that, and I also don't need to be the star, I don't need to be the best person on the panel or the best speaker in the conference. I mean, I like it if somebody says that I am immune to that kind of thing of course but I've said to myself you're not trying to be the best you're just trying to be you as much you as you can be and then you just go out and do it and then you move on and go on to the next thing and if you get some feedback negative or positive if it's negative and it's useful good if it's positive and it therefore makes you feel terrific and like you hit the right note and that's also useful because you can take that forward to the next one too that's well and good but if you don't get any feedback don't worry about it. Just carry on and do the next one. And that is where I think the confidence to use your voice comes from. It doesn't come from, I know every answer. I'm wiser than everyone else at all. It comes from, it doesn't matter what other people think about what I say. As long as what I'm saying is, I believe it. I am being truthful. I am reacting as openly and honestly as I can and what other people think of that is not the point that's where confidence is I think we think confidence sometimes is in pretending that you've got all the answers and that you know everything blah 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 or desperately trying to get to that point and I don't think it's got anything to do with that at all I actually think it's just I'm going to say what I know and what I think and mm. that means if someone asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I'm really happy to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And not feel like that's a terrible failing on my part. Or if I answer something and someone says, well, you're wrong there because of blah, 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 and they have a good point, I'm very happy to say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I'll go away and think about it. I don't have to be, it's skin. I don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. just as well because I'm not. <laughs> Who is? Who is? 
And I and I have that visual again of you sitting on the plane drinking a champagne, saying, "Well, the pilot's going to drive this." I, again, it's that that admission of I am I am not in control and trying to control everything and everyone, um, and I can breathe and relax a little. Yeah, that's yeah. letting go. The pilot is flying the plane. Is letting go. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when my daughter was very ill. I realized that I couldn't do anything except try and love her and be there as much as I could, though I would never stay. She had lots of terrible, painful things. You know, they have to suction them when they're intubated every couple of days. It's horrible. Mm. Luckily, she was a newborn, so she couldn't anticipate it, which was something, but it was painful. And she had stout gases, which are as bad as they sound. And I just painful intervention, tiny little baby, you know, just awful. She's fine, by the way. She's yeah. in her mid thirties. Yeah. Children of her own, blah, blah, blah. It all turned out all right in the end. But it was an awful beginning. And I used to go in and she had one hand that had no, you know, things in it. So I used to hold her hand and I used to say to her, I'm your mother and I don't hurt you. And whenever there was any painful intervention, I would go and I wouldn't help them. I said, No, I'm not doing anything that's painful. Um, because I felt very strongly that she needed not to associate me with mm. the painful intervention. But that I knew it had to happen and that they saved a life and, you know, all of that. Mm. So I let the doctors do their job and I realised that my job was to be her mother um, as yeah. much as I could be in that situation. And I think that's carried on too, this idea of whose problem is it? You know, who who has the power to do something about this? And if you think you're the center of the universe and that everything revolves around you and five-year-olds do, and so they should, that's their developmental stage and no one should try to talk them out of it. It's fine. They'll Mm. grow up and realize they're not, but you don't want to be a five-year-old when you're 66, still thinking Mm. the world revolves around you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the great liberation of not feeling the world revolves around you is you can let go of so much shit. Mm Mm-hmm. So many things are not your fault, including how your children turn out and who mm. they decide to marry and how they parent their own kids. I mean, you, some, you you can let go of that as well. You can be there, be supportive, love them, you know, hold their hand and say, I'm your mother and I don't hurt you. Um, but you don't have to necessarily agree with everything they do mm. um, and still think, that's the way they want to do it. Good. Because I love that line that um, was the start of, um, I'm trying to remember the poet's name now and I can't, Larkin, Philip Larkin. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They don't mean to, but they do. And I think as soon as you accept that, you become a better parent. You'll still fuck them up, but you'll mm-hmm. be a better parent. Mm, yes, and I... Um... Oh gosh, I resonate on so many levels, and I, I, I have to share that my daughter, when she was born, was uh, in ICU for the first three days of her life, and um, it wasn't as serious as as what you've you've said that you went through. But I can I can totally relate, and I think there is maybe that small piece of me that still has that regret. So I thank you for sharing that because it's time to let that go. That was out of my hands. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> but you did the best you could. And, um, sometimes the best you could, you can do is well, feels inadequate, but that's okay. It, it, you know, it's mm. the best you can do and mm. we are all inadequate and that's okay to be inadequate. It's, it, yeah, it's not. Mm-hmm something we should beat ourselves up about Mm. when we can't save our children um, in all sorts of ways. Um, I remember when we came home, well, when we were going home, they said to me, your baby stopped breathing company, it's hospital policy to offer you what they called an apnea mat, which was a a mat that you put in their cot and if they stopped breathing, alarms would ring. Mm. And I looked at this doctor and I said, well, do you need, do, do we need it? You know, she's better. And they, he said, I'm not allowed to give you advice one way or the other. I hate that. Mm. And I looked at him and I said, well, if it was your baby and she'd done, gone through what my baby's gone through, would you take it? 
And he said, he looked at me, he gave me this look and he said, no, I wouldn't. I said, thank you. No. We won't be taking it. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I can feed you, I can love you, I can keep you warm, I can minimise danger, like keep it to a minimum, but you have to do the breathing. I can't do mm. the breathing for you. You have mm. to do that. And I just have to let it go. And if you don't breathe, then there's, I'll have to deal with that, but I can't do it for you. That's amazing. And that was another understanding that mm. however devastating it would have been, there was only so much I could do. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's very powerful. Very nice. So I think um, I would love to just touch on this storytelling piece because obviously writing is second nature to you. It's, it's you know, it just flows naturally for you from all the books you've written and all the articles and everything else. Tell me a little bit about how you feel like storytelling plays a role in connection and happiness for women in our society. Well, stories, everything. We all tell ourselves stories all the time. Uh, I mean, memory is faulty because we rewrite it. We're always rewriting and editing our memories. And sometimes it's interesting talking to, say, your siblings or your kids about various incidents and the way they remember it is very different from how you remember it or the things they remember that you don't even remember at all. I mean, mm -hmm. so you realise everyone's got their own kind of narrative story in their head and they're not the same. And so story is, it's not about the facts of a story. It's always about the emotional truth of a story. So what we connect with when we watch Game of Thrones or Succession or The Crown um, or read a fantastic novel or whatever, is we connect with the emotion that the characters feel uh, and that we feel um, as they're going through it. We tend to feel along with them, which is why when you go to the cinema, and I know hardly anyone does, but I still recommend it, and watch a, a movie on the big screen, um, Particularly at comedy, it's fantastic because what it does is it tells you how we're all much more the same than we're different. We love to police our differences and segment people all the time. I hate it. I hate segmentation um, by age, by gender, by race, by class, by school. I hate it. it I, I think it's false. I don't think it's true. I think we're much more the same than we're different. Our experiences may be different, but our emotions are the same. So a good storyteller knows that. They know that. The story they're going to tell you, they hope, is different and unusual and original, and it's not probably something you surely experience. But the emotions that it's going to trigger, you have experienced all those emotions in different situations, in different circumstances, but we know those emotions. We all do. No matter our religion, language, age, we all know those emotions. So you watch a comedy, for example, Nobody holds up a sign and says, laugh here. But the entire audience explodes in laughter at the same moment, precisely the same moment. That tells you human beings are more the same and they're different. And good mm. storytellers know that and they know how to trigger that emotion at that particular time. And that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy creating a journey of some kind. I hate the word journey, but I can't think of a better one right now. And getting people to come along that journey with me in the book or the article or the whatever it is, the speech, you know, mm -hmm. the podcast. Because then we're connected. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all feeling the same things and we're all responding in similar ways and we're all recognising our shared humanity, the things that connect us. Well, but with witnessing at the moment in the Middle East is an example of how rigid differentiation to the extent that walls are built and mm -hmm. different rules for different groups of people depending on their ethnic or religious background is destructive and ultimately ends in complete disarray. And so whenever we build walls and whenever we say we don't want those people in and we don't want to let these people do this or that or the next thing, those are the other. 
that's mm. when we lose sight of our shared humanity and that's when bad things happen. Mm. Um, and that's where we're at in the world today. It's really scary how we're re-establishing our boundaries on one another. Not the good boundaries that says this is where I finish and you begin, but the bad boundaries which says you are fundamentally different from me because you are a Muslim or you mm -hmm. are a right winger or you are whatever. Um, no, we might have fundamentally different views of the world, but you are not fundamentally different from me. You are fundamentally the same as me. Mm. And if I can find that, if I can find that shared emotion, then we will recognize one another. And then it's harder to be cruel and destroy one another. Um, that's where kindness is in that recognition that someone else's pain is just like your pain. Mm. And if you could do a little bit to help them feel less pain, you will feel less pain too. Whereas if when you create more pain in other people because of the pain you feel, you will increase the pain you feel. Mm. Oh, that's <clears throat> made me quite emotional. <laughs> that was very nice. Thank Life you. This is complicated. It's really quite simple. Mm. We overcomplicate, overthink, overanalyze, overjudge so much when really it's just emotions are what connect us. We need to know that and therefore that enables us to allow ourselves to feel our emotions and express our emotions <laughs> and that's how we could connect more closely. And I think that's what art and all art is trying to do. It's to move us and when we use the word move, we literally may mean to move you from one emotional state to another emotional state and that movement, if you can do that with everybody who views the painting or everyone in the audience or what. Then that, for that moment, everyone is connected through that same process of moving from laughing to crying or whatever it is or awe or enjoyment. Music does that. Theatre does that. That's why the arts really matter because they are about us connecting. And we've mm. gone so far down the science, data, hard edge, number driven, and they separate us. Mm -hmm. And so now we've become very separated. So we need our storytellers like never before. Mm, so true. And thank God we have you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are a lot of people who would not agree with that. But that's okay. <laughs> that's up to them. And actually, that's a good thing because you know mm. you're having an effect. I often, often say to people, uh, women in particular, are being absolutely piled on or humiliated in some way. The more they hate you, the more effective you're being. That means you're having an impact. You've got a voice. Yeah, I was told the same thing. <laughs> That's right. And, and and sometimes it's very, very thin comfort indeed, but it is true and no one who's ever changed the world didn't have an enemy. Yeah, so true. So tell me a little bit about are you are you writing a book currently? Yes, I'm writing a crime novel with a very strong climate change uh, theme because I'm very, very, very worried about what we're doing to this planet. Um, I'm mortified that I'm going to pass on to my grandchildren a world that is in a far worse state than the world my grandparents um, left to me. That is such a failure of my generation. We've terribly, terribly stuffed up on that. And so when is that, has that got a release date or is that just in the pipeline? I've got to, I'm um, 40,000 words into it, so I've got to submit it by the end of June, but I'm hoping I might be able to get it to the publisher earlier um, and I think it'll be out sometime in 2024. Very exciting. <clears throat> so just before I ask a quick fire round, just a quick five fun questions, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I don't think so. No, I mean, oh, I'm happy. Great. We've, we've covered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We've just rabbited on. It's been fun. <laughs> well, I've rabbited on, but. I've had fun. I've laughed a lot. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm so interested to know. I could not make this one of my fi uh, quick five fire round questions. 
what is your favorite book? And it doesn't have to be of all time. It could be just now. Um, there's uh, so many books that I've really loved and enjoyed, but I think I'll have to go back to an old favorite, which is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Um, I must reread it again. Um, I, I, I just get so much more out of that book every time. Um, the Mad Woman in the Attic is fascinating, but also I, I now and now more think that we're all mad women in, a, in the attic and far from being afraid of that we should celebrate and d delight in that um and when she says you think because i am poor i am little and poor and plain that i don't feel things just as much as you do and i just think that sort of stuff is so good um so yeah i, lo I read that book very young and loved it and i've reread it many times and yeah i love it it's time for us to pull that the old book out again, I think. Uh, what are you trying to unlearn? A vanity. Uh, I'm trying to unlearn vanity. Um, uh, and, and to let go of the idea of being beautiful and young. Um, it's not as hard as I thought it would be um, uh, because it's, it's interesting perhaps is standards. <laughs> conveniently changed as you get older because I, I notice now suddenly a lot of older women who I think look terrific um, and they're maybe just as wrinkly baggy saggy as I am but they are elegant and they you know look like they're really engaged with life and you know I look at people like Maggie Beer and Prue Leith and the bright you can see I sort of bright colors and because as you age what tends to happen is the color fades from you 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 look you know from your hair from your skin it, it all fades so building color in is really um fun um so I, yeah letting go of vanity is something i don't think i've achieved um but at the same time i think that's a really important that's the thing i think about trying to hold on to youth it's like trying to hold on to anything the longer you cling to what you can't have anymore, and I don't care how much work you have, you're still getting older. Um, what you can't have stops you fully enjoying what it is that this new stage has to offer you. Absolutely. Yes, very, very wise. And for the record, I think you look absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Uh, best advice, <laughs> Best advice about happiness that you've ever been given? Happiness is not a goal. Happiness is not a goal. I think John Lennon said it best. Happiness is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Um, happiness tends to come incidentally. You suddenly realise, oh, that I felt really happy then or that this is a great moment. Or, But happiness is momentary. Um, it's fleeting. Um, and therefore when we make it a goal, we actually it, we chase it further away and then it becomes an expectation and then when we suddenly we think oh, are we happy enough oh how happy is happy when people say i just want my children to be happy i go don't do that your children are not going to be happy they're going to be miserable sometimes really miserable and they're going to go through lots of pain and then they're going to feel even worse and they're not going to be able to confide in you about their pain because you told them they had to be happy because that will make you happy and in fact you want your children to be happy because then you can be happy so selfish desire what you want is your children to be fully themselves and to be able to talk to you openly and honestly about whatever it is that they're going through or dealing with. And happiness is not a goal. And if you get some moments of happiness, and we all do, oh, it's great, fantastic, grab them, love them, pleasure them. But when they go, which they inevitably do, don't blame yourself and don't think, oh, I've got to leave this man because I'm not happy with him anymore. I've got to find the man who makes me happy. Man doesn't make you happy. A moment makes you happy. Um, you have a capacity to... I think it's not happiness, it's contentment or to, or acceptance. Acceptance, again, it's going back to this thing where you accept your own feelings, whatever they are. But, yeah, the best advice, happiness is not a goal. Oh, and the other one, it's really great, actually. This one is a gift to everyone. I was given this by a counsellor many years ago who I was working with at the time. We were running a group. And he said happiness is a spot on, a, on the continuum between boredom and fear. And he said, so... And he said it's different for everybody. Some people like a, a, a nice, safe, quiet life and therefore they like a lot of boredom and not a lot of fear. And some people like 
a much more exciting, stimulating life. So they like a lot of fear and not a lot of boredom. And what's good about it is if you find yourself feeling lethargic, depressed, no energy for anything, dragging yourself through the day, you've got too much boredom, not enough fear. If you find yourself feeling hyper anxious tense can't sleep you've got too much fear and not enough boredom and why that's so useful is it helps you to do something practical ah i'm anxious i need to actually put more safety more predictability into my life oh, i'm sort of mm, depressed i need to put a bit more risk and a bit more chance into my life mm, i love that that's fantastic if you could wave a fairy wand, what would you change about the world? I would get rid of hierarchies. I would flatten the structure of the world. I would get us all to believe that we are all of equal value. I would get us to recognise that we're more the same, that we're different, and that everyone is worthy of respect and that respect doesn't have to be earned. It is in fact intrinsic. Um, I don't have to respect your point of view, but I do have to respect you. As I always fail to live up to my own standards, I can't do that with Donald Trump. I'm sorry. I have no respect for that man on any level. Got to draw a line somewhere, I'm sure. Got to draw a line somewhere. But um, yeah, that is what I would do. I would uh, and, I'll, and by doing getting rid of hierarchy, I think what I get rid of is striving, strive. And the pointy elbow way of approaching life and the win I'm a winner and you're a loser, I hate all that. I hate all that. And so I would love to wave that away. So my last question was going to be tell us one practical tool we can put into practice today that could help us achieve more contentment or happiness. But I feel like you kind of answered that in the, in the last question or the question prior. So I think I'm going to tweak it and say, tell us one practical tool that we can put into practice today to help us achieve more connection. Listen, listen, but really listen. So I was very lucky that after I came out of all the counselling and things I did, I trained as a, I trained as a relationships counsellor, but I never practised. And I also, prior to that, I worked as a telephone counsellor where you get taught active listening. And active listening is where you don't get caught up in the content of what people are saying. You actually listen for what's the emotional um, driver behind what's being said to you. So, you know, a clunky way of expressing that would be if someone's telling you a long, complicated story about something horrible that happened to them at work or something instead of getting into the minutiae of who did said what to whom it, it, it's more like it sounds like you felt really humiliated by that moment and then the person can correct you no I didn't feel humiliated I felt angry whatever it is or they can say yes I was so humiliated I, I felt so and then you can have a real conversation about the humiliation they felt and you can perhaps share when you felt humiliated and that's when you'll start to connect. If you just get caught up in the content of the story, the plot, if you like, rather than the... Because often when people, for example, read a really good book, and certainly this happens to me, and someone will say, what's it about? And it's a few months after I read it, I go, uh, I can't actually remember much about what it's about. But I really remember how I felt, you know, that I was very, um, I was very engaged and I was... Uh, gripped by the by what was happening or it made me laugh or it made I cried you know I wept at this book in parts because it is that it's and the reason I remember those things is at that moment the reader and the writer and the writer may have been dead for 200 years but the reader and the writer are connected uh, and that's what great art can do it can connect you to people who lived many centuries before you and whatever art lasts from our culture will connect with people who may live many centuries into the future and what that does is it again reminds us it doesn't even matter what era we're living in we're more the same than we're different and that there lies connection vive 
la difference, say the French. No, 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 no. Vive la similarité. Oh, beautiful. I feel like doing one of these ones. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for everything today, for joining us, but for sharing your wisdom, your sense of humor and your joy. It's very refreshing. And most of all, I think for your transparency, it's been absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. No point in having any secrets. They don't do you any good and they don't help anyone else. Oh, keep sharing your secrets. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, Nicole. Thank you. Gosh, it was an absolute pleasure to chat with Jane. And here's some of the takeaways reframe your view. If you struggle with anxiety, find a way to step back and reframe your thinking. You can't be in control of everything. You aren't in control of everything. Step back from trying to pilot the plane, grab a glass of champagne and focus on enjoying those bubbles. Embrace vulnerability and surrender. Overcoming anxiety involves embracing vulnerability and surrendering control. Recognize the absence that you are the most special person in the world and the futility of trying to control every aspect of life. Challenge societal expectations. Women need to reject societal expectations, find self-acceptance and resist the pursuit of perfection. We need to be comfortable with flaws and not let others dictate worth or emotional expression. Dealing with anticipation and anxiety. Address the human tendency to anticipate and worry about the future. Jane advises focusing on the present and adopting a case sera, sera attitude. Dealing with challenges as they arise instead of getting anxious about hypothetical scenarios. Connect through shared stories. Incorporate storytelling into your life. Share and listen to the stories that evoke emotions. Recognize the shared humanity in these narratives. It's a pathway to empathy and understanding, bridging gaps between people. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next week, you are loved and you are worthy.